are live. Oh my God. Hello, YouTube. Hello, world, as the programmers like saying. Hello, gamers. Hello, game developers. Hello, everyone else. I am Lev. I'm a community coordinator from Mobidictum. With me in my wonderful online studio today is Yako from La Gameworks. Yeah, people are still coming over. Let me quickly do a bit of Discord promotion last second, uh, just to make sure that people know we are, we are. Yeah, what can I say? I mean, it's really, um, I've had a couple of experiences recently with Forex games. Akala Gameworks is known for developing Forex games. Uh, and I mean, strategies in general are a rather interesting genre. Uh, and I don't know, like what, why Forex games? Strategies, do you, do you like them? Or I guess like, unless do you like them and like, is there any specific reason behind like why you wanted to do narrative design for strategy games of all gaming genres that there are? Okay, yeah, that's a simple question, but it's going to be a complicated answer. Well, why Forex games? The answer to that is that like our studio was founded by seven people maybe five years ago, and almost all of us were big, big Forex and crime strategy fans. Uh, so mm -hmm. like when we were thinking about, okay, what is, what is going to be the focus of the studio we are going to start, uh, it, well, we were like, it could, the consensus was that, okay, this is the genre we want to do. And well, as my role as the writer, narrative designer guy kind of meant that, okay, if we are, if I am a narrative designer guy and we are doing a Forex game, that means that, okay, then I will end up doing narrative stuff for a forex game uh, but we also wanted to try something new uh, with the game in the sense that many of us as forex veterans felt like there aren't that many very like deep story experiences within forex genre which is quite understandable but at the same time we felt like there's something we could do something special we could do here because those kind of experiences where you are at the same time leading a nation through war and diplomacy and everything but at the same time it still has a real immersive narrative experience where you actually talk with people and everything we actually, to tell us to a do bit, that. pardon, I, I, I interrupted, yeah. but can you tell us a bit actually about the premise of uh, Pegasus Expedition and what is it that the player sets out to do in that game? Yeah, well, we were thinking about the basic setting and the, that kind of science fiction that has a war, with, a war between humans and aliens generally starts with the aliens invading humans. And we felt like, what if the humans are actually the aliens and they invade the other aliens so we wanted to swap that around so in the Pegasus expedition story humanity is very greatly threatened in their own galaxy by this invincible alien civilization and thing and they basically pick up everything they can and like flee to another galaxy to like at least buy themselves some time and that another galaxy is actually full of other civilizations and races and everything so that kind of starts a domino effect when a big group of desperate and heavily armed people arrive in that galaxy yeah that sounds insane in a sense that it's very interesting how you know they were attacked and then they sort of in the process of migration move into the territory where others live but it always makes me curious about you know like if there were any historical inspirations behind the story and uh, like, how do you use the historical inspirations in your narrative design? Yeah, that, that's a good question because the answer is yes. Yes, there is. So, like, the original inspiration for me was probably, like, the hunts during the lake antiquity and how that created the chain reaction of other peoples fleeing towards the Western Roman Empire and everything that happened afterwards. So, kind of, that was the example or the formula for me that how this kind of migration could happen and how we can like create a lot of conflict without like making the player and the humans like being the very very bad guys because i've always found very black and white these are good guys because they are good and these are bad guys because well they are bad guys it's always quite boring and in history that happens very very rarely most of the time they are just conflicting interests and then things happen so I to, to to like the latter part of your question that do I draw inspiration from history in narrative design like when 
deciding what's going to happen with the world and like this the big picture stuff i a lot a lot take inspiration from history like not not plagiate but like take inspiration in the sense that okay this situation here resembles our situation in the story that much that i mean the same kind of conclusions or what happens next or what follows from that um is like believable realistic plausible yeah. in that sense this also makes me curious because you know like for 4x a lot of story is ultimately crafted by the player right the player is the one making executive decisions uh the player is the one building infrastructure fleet sheep ships and i was sort of wondering how can you compare uh, or like how can you bring in fixed narrative with this player made narrative in a way that makes a player interested in playing your game yeah that's that's a question we we thought about a lot during the production of the game because forex games are inherently quite sandboxy and generally the freedom of the player to do basically anything they want is a big feature and if you want any kind of overarching uh, narrative that actually has anything to do with the world and affects the world in any way then it just has to put up some boundaries because otherwise like the story says one thing and what's going on is something completely different than that this kind of disconnection uh, develops and that sometimes happens with some in, in some forex experiences i have had so first off we wanted to have that storyless mode where there's still like the the emergent text boxes are there but the overarching story is removed so when the player watch something completely sandbox there's like four different scenarios for them to play one of them is that very classic you are randomly put on the map and then just mm -hmm. You do what you do. And but I've noticed, this... like also uh, resources change for each of them. Like there are different conditions that sort of augment each of their play styles. Yes, yes. The factions we wanted to make them different because <laughs> because that, that that's that's what like gives replayability and makes it makes it more interesting. But with the I story, actually, okay. Uh, yeah. Apologies. I actually wanted to address one of the things that uh, the comments said, and I want to let you finish the thought that you said, but I also want to address one of our viewers' uh, comments. Which is, you know, in the game, the story indicates a certain amount of urgency, uh, but the actual gameplay does not seem to sort of enforce this. And I'm sort of curious about this myself. Like, was there at any point where you considering doing like a mechanic that would inspire a player, like incentivize a player to make urgent decisions? Or was this just something else? That's a really good question because we talk about that a lot. And like our team, development team had two camps. <laughs> One of us was saying that because the story says that you have to hurry, you have to have to hurry. But at the same time, the other camp was like that saying that people in this genre generally like to like they have different approaches to these kind of games and some want to take it slow and some want to take it really fast. And like we didn't want to too much force every player to take that fast approach if they are one of those people who like to take it slow. But at the same time, there are some small things that change. For example, the ending of the game changes slightly depending on how many turns you spent. I, I think the threshold, thresholds are like 100, 150 and 200 turns. So like uh, some spots we wanted to like that react to a bit uh, to the player, but we didn't want to interfere with the player's play style too much because that that could have been unpleasant yeah yeah and i see we have a one fan already actively engaging uh i mean i've sort of noticed a certain not necessarily dissonance but more so a feeling as if you know uh i want to start building up my infrastructure right i want to start playing in a way that works for me best but at some point, I just start feeling as if I need to follow a very specific set of instructions in order to proceed through the game, which makes me, uh, as uh, somebody who likes a strategy for its opportunities of individualistic storytelling, curious about whether, uh, whether you would consider, how do I put it? What would you change if you were to make another storyline, another narrative? 
for a Forex game. And if you had an opportunity to make to make another Forex game, yeah, what changes would you make to your story storytelling process? Okay, that, that's a good question too. I'll quickly go back to the earlier one because it's really part of my answer to this one. But like the, our answer to that, how do we keep the story and the sandbox consistent was putting like some boundaries that some factions are kind of special and the player can't like declare war on them at least not before it's the right time but at the same time we left like 80 percent of the galaxy like completely free for the player to like deal with it as they please uh, and how what would i do differently i mean i feel like we achieved something very special in the sense that what happens in the galaxy the early part like the first dirty turns or something are kind of an intro the galaxy is not actually in that very in that state in which it's going to be when you actually can go to all of the to all of the galaxy there's that big big old empire that is called like the player causes the collapse of that empire and like most of the stuff going on in the galaxy after that is like the the new situation where that empire has collapsed and they like the the, the people of the empire are trying to get that back on and the other peoples who have been repressed by the empire are finally becoming independent and everything so it kind of causes the player causes in the beginning that explosion that kind of makes the galaxy unstable as a whole so in that sense it, it needed that early part where we both introduce player to the game and we kind of let the player see the cause of everything that happens afterwards but now finally i'm finally getting to the, my answer to the question i really like what we achieved there but we to the story content as a whole i think maybe 70 percent are about are the like the the main story that causes some kind of restrictions and maybe 30 percent okay these are just on top of my head but something like that 30 percent are in that sense emergent content that they are in no way restrict the player because there are many side quests but the player kind of when they start the side quest they choose a side and then they are locked in with that side for the side's story to have like any sense it is so i would still love to do a coherent story but i would maybe make the percentages more like 50 50 or even like 60 percent emergent 40 percent main story to allow for more freedom like uh, the similar immersive experience but maybe shorten it spread it out a bit and fill the other stuff with, with more emergent content and yeah. that would help replayability and like the game would probably be interesting in even a third playthrough I mean, if the emergent content is different every time yeah i mean i'm a writer myself and you know it's definitely games are one of those mediums where you know it's a tricky thing of how to write for games because you know unlike a film or books you aren't really the your what you want to say doesn't really matter as much as what a player can do with the game you design right and it's very interesting helping players like ask different questions with the games you make uh, and with the consequences to the actions they make and uh, i guess one of the questions i really want to ask you is are there any uh, interesting narrative examples from Pegasus Expedition of where a uh, player's consequences and result in storytelling. You were like player action actions. Whoa, whoa. Yeah. I mean, like the main story has some choices in it, but because in the end it's about saving Earth, and we, I, I'm sorry, but we didn't give like let the player abandon Earth because that would be like admitting defeat in the beginning. So the player kind of either succeeds in saving Earth or they don't so that that's kind of black and white in that sense but that's not really about pegasus galaxy at all that player just like enables themselves to save the earth back home but it's it's not that doesn't really affect what they do in the pegasus galaxy and then there are plenty of side stories that have to do with the different civilization of the pegasus galaxy and those can be resolved in 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 many ways like the player can of course just ignore that okay i'm not going to take up this uh, these factions are going to remain like free prey for me or they can for example when that big empire falls down um, because of the player they can kind of create a new puppet state with the puppet emperor for themselves if they like and the the or there's another civil war going on with another civilization with like a modernist leader or between a modernist leader and a kind of traditional conservative leader and they can like 
interfere to help either one of them to win the war or they can just decide to like be war with both of them and just subjugate the whole whole place and those decisions affect the state of the galaxy a lot and they affect the ending of course and so on so like this the side stories especially do branch i've noticed like i'm reading the comments and i've noticed that uh, the mention of the canon playthrough so is there a canon ending to the main story of pegasus expedition well the ending consists of 12 15 okay honestly i, I don't remember but so let, let's say 12 different parts and like those different parts kind of they are like interchangeable in the sense that okay how you dealt with this situation puts one of three options into the ending and then how did you deal with this situation puts one of three different options to the ending so it's kind of crafted to actually reflect what the player did in the galaxy but the saving the earth part is mainly about if the player actually got through the game then they succeed but that how many turns it did kind of affects how triumphant the victory was or where they almost basically late to save the earth so so in that sense saving managing to save earth is canon of course but how like which puppet or emperor they put on the throne or stuff like that uh, i'm not really sure and of course i have my personal favorites and uh, after the launch of the game i did a poll with the master of civil war guest that did people pick the which one of the like sides in the civil war did people pick and i actually found myself in the minority so <laughs> look look looks like my my thoughts are not canon in this <laughs> This how, sense at how, all. Did it, how did it feel to end up in the minority of the fans of your own game? I mean, of course, I tried to make both sides as cool as possible, but I just like personally felt like, okay, I think this guy is much cooler than the other one, but it just it just looks like that I was wrong. <laughs> but it, it, I, it did, a difference wasn't that big, so like I'm not not too ashamed of that. It was maybe like forty percent, sixty percent, or something. I guess this is also a little curious because, you know, you are the one writing these guys. You are the one writing these factions. And I guess my a question to you, writer to writer, how does it feel when, you know, like somebody you like less than someone else is liked more by other people? I mean, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's fine by me because if they like the other guy I wrote, I mean, I'm still... I still wrote that other guy too, so like I, it, it's it's still fine, but it like helps to uh, broaden my weave in the sense that, of course, not everyone feels similarly about what things are cooler than others. So it's it's good to keep in mind that not everyone feels and thinks exactly like me, and it would be better if I I have options that are cool for different people and so on so it, it was just i mean I, i'm perfectly happy with the situation but it was really interesting to find out i was a little bit surprised i mean any writer probably would be because you know it's always interesting you know how even do you sort of weave this story into this kind of gameplay without the player feeling as if they're not participating in it that's a very interesting question as well and well, because we had to leave most of the factions like free sandbox for the player, one good way to like throw something new into the galaxy was like add like new stuff coming to the galaxy. So, okay, this is kind of spoilery. I won't be too de detailed here, but there's like one galaxy wide crisis later on in the game that isn't caused by the humans, but it's like big threat to the whole galaxy. And that is main story thing and it's thrown in by the main story but still we we left that thing to interact with the galaxy quite freely so like if the player is really goes fast in to stop the thing then it's it's stopped faster and if the player kind of decides to hold back and see what happens then the player probably lets the thing take over a large part of the galaxy and so on so we did try to leave a lot of freedom inside those things kind of like the player can decide to deal with them with with different ways and also the outcome would be different just because there are many ai factions doing different things and sometimes they 
like <laughs> end up doing better and sometimes they end up doing worse do, do, does the AI usually like band together against you or are they more frequent to like fight each other while you're conquering stuff uh, that was actually one thing one balance thing because there are arguments for both of those i mean if the ais don't really see the player as a threat even when they become bigger and bigger and these in these games you become bigger and bigger that's kind of the point usually and then they kind of they stop posing a real threat to the player and that is a kind of a problem we had ourselves encountered in many other games of the genre because that's quite com common that when the player is big enough they actually can no longer lose and they like no one in the map can no longer challenge the player faction in any real way so we try to add those new things happening in the galaxy to create new threats to the player so they like can just sit there as the biggest factions and and just stomp everyone so we add the mechanism actually... how the player kind of the factions start liking the player less when they become bigger and bigger but not too much so that they would be like a player the player and one other faction in the whole galaxy because that would become very boring in the other hand but okay what were you saying Yes, like it's something that a lot of Forex games suffer from. And I'm assuming a similar stuff has been a challenge for you when you are designing Pegasus. But, you know, like when you feel like, as, as you said, when you feel very powerful, when you, when like there comes a point where you already like have advanced enough infrastructure to where you can't lose, what would be interesting? What were the, in, were the options for you, you were considering? When you were when you were like coming up with ways of like kicking the player out of that comfort zone, were there any other interesting ideas that you may have brainstormed but may have not executed, or maybe you'll want to execute them next time? Are there any new things you want to try out on this genre on that front? Uh, it's interesting to me. So yeah. Well, we did quite a bit of uh, balancing around it because many of the games of the genre and also we have kind of a system happiness stability system that means that the larger the player faction gets the more of the resources they have to put on like keeping the thing together so their like resource input output wouldn't won't go up like exponentially uh, and we had a too harsh happiness system in the beginning in the sense that actually the optimal way of playing that was in the beginning of the early access that the the optimal way of playing the game was to keep conquering in a really blitzkrieg way because you got a happiness bonus from winning a battle or conquering a system which meant that you had to just keep conquering and you wouldn't develop those systems that much uh, so you wouldn't try to build happiness infrastructure structure you would just like keep conquering and keeping people happy because every day you have conquered something new but that that was kind of against our idea of letting people play it slow if they want to so we like made the system a uh, lot more lenient but i mean basically i feel like if we talk about other factions other than the player faction we have basically two options one is to give something special to the existing factions that kind of steps on the sandbox but not necessarily too much and uh, the other one is to throw in some new factions to do some throwing something new to like stir the pot a bit and we created this kind of nemesis fleet system in which when a faction is about to be destroyed they like realize that it's their existence in the question at that point so they throw up like put up one last fleet and that is a very, very strong fleet. So that would mean that whenever you want to wipe someone completely away from the, out of the galaxy, it's going to be extra difficult because they are not going to become extinct without a fight. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually, that's actually one of the things I've noticed that I haven't noticed in a lot of other games, because for example, uh, with Total War, that's a big problem. Like, you have a big battle, and while the enemy's recuperating an army, you quickly destroy his entire infrastructure. But that whole thing sort of puts a wrench into that plan. Because it doesn't matter how many great armies you've beat, uh, you are still going to have to face this big last stand army eventually. 
Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, go on, say, finish, <laughs> finish your sentence. <laughs> yes, yes, which sort of also kind of like knowing this as a player that kind of discourages you from wiping these fractions out completely, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly, exactly. That was our aim. That was our aim. It, it's cool that you pick it, pick it up immediately, but our biggest. The map gets more and more boring the less there are factions the less factions there are that that happens in every game this kind of game that if that the less when there are less factions there's just less stuff happening so we want kind of to tip the player the balance with the player decisions that okay it may be actually more beneficial to like leave them let them exist as a three star systems small faction and like just extra some resources out of them rather than spend all those resources to completely wipe them out at least immediately so yeah that that is was exactly our idea yeah i'm seeing also the comments uh, the last stand army weakens their other fleets oh yeah i mean i i guess that's the point like if we can't destroy them you know we're going to at least we're going to at least uh, make it hard for them to conquer others, you know. Uh, yeah, and also the AI gets it if there are two AI factions at war with each other. And that s same situation can trigger as well, which hopefully the, the aim was also to kind of help the AI factions to stay alive a bit longer, because it's harder for them to destroy each other. Honestly, this is one of the questions I do want to ask as well. Uh, that I didn't think about writing down, but I do really want to know. How do you design AI for rivaling factions uh, in a way where a player feels as if it's a living civilization? Okay, the first thing, the very first thing I'm going to say that it's complicated. AI for these kind of games is complicated and it, it really is not easy. And I can say with the other games that like often they... AI still doesn't feel like it's making rational decisions that a human would. And the reason is that it's it's really complicated. But like I wasn't doing it. I don't understand AI that much. But we have had a great guy, Yussi, um, who created that in the sense that, well, he has a really complicated model where the faction kind of like checks what is my situation and then like checks, okay, what kind of neighbors do I have? And then checks, okay, what do I need? Who do I fear? Who do I like? How can I change that? And then it like allocates its resources to building or creating armies. And it feels, if it feels like, okay, I don't like this neighbor and also I'm stronger than that neighbor, then they can decide that they will go to war and everything. So they kind of, Every faction, we try to make it so that every faction really tries to see what is their beneficial to them and then act accordingly. As a narrative designer, was there at any point any significant input that you've uh, put into the development of that AI? Were there like any specific demands you as a narrative person wanted AI to have? Well, with the human factions, they are kind of a special case because they are very story relevant factions and the player can kind of fight them, but only at the relevant point in the story. The other factions, like I, I felt like it's a great idea to just have them act as sensibly as possible because that's that's what we're trying to achieve with that. Though they have like that cultural kind of thing that they dislike other cultures a bit more than they dislike other factions of their own culture, which is quite natural there. But with the human factions, especially because the player actually discusses the situation with the other human leaders and the player can actually suggest or even demand them to act in a certain way for a while like okay guys stop expanding right now and like try to consolidate what you have please so the story system there's like actually when i've designed the story by actually writing json files with commands that the game runs i actually have written like commands for those factions that okay now you have to like like take this kind of more passive defensive stance for this amount of turns and stop stop expanding for a while and so so what i wanted was like okay you can have the ais to do what they feel like is the best but give me some tools to give commands to the ais so they can act the same way they pretend they are acting when they are actually talking to the player because some of the faction leaders actually talk with the player quite a bit and it would be 
would be a bit funny that if they acted like, oh, I'm so peaceful and I've, I've never hurt anyone. And at the same time, they are the biggest dictator and conqueror in the galaxies. Yeah, that's a bit of a dissonance that I've sort of really wanted to ask a couple of questions about as well. Like, how do you ensure that this dissonance does not occur? Because, you know, it does hamper players' experience when, you know, they they see a peaceful guy, they see Gandhi, but then Gandhi throws a nuke. Oh, the classic the civilization classic. example. <laughs> yeah, and we, we actually had a kind of a Gandhi situation with the other, one of the three human factions that Dara's combined fleet is meant to act more defensively and more peacefully and like in the discussions with the other human leaders they are the one ones who advocate for a more peaceful approach and uh, and and during the early part of the early access and during our testing they were just out of control they would out conquer the player they would envelope the player <laughs> Like, like <laughs> flank them and then go in front of them and kind of landlock the player. <laughs> and at that point, people are like, okay, this, 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 this is exactly the kind of dissonance that we don't want to happen. This is just stupid. So either I change the story and make them like warlike lunatics or we have to put some, control them a bit. <laughs> How did you solve this? Uh, well, we solved it by giving them a kind of time locked boundaries in the sense that okay during first 20 turns you can have only maximum of 10 systems if you lose some you can conquer back some but then you stop and you build up and then when 10 turns have passed we up the limit a bit and then they can okay now you can conquer five systems more if you can um, but you can't conquer 100 systems in 20 turns because that's what they originally did oh wow that sounds that sounds definitely insane. That sounds definitely a lot of fun. That does sound like something I want to play even more. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sorry. Now they are quite a quite a defensive and docile as they they they're supposed to be. Oh, oh no! I I hate the part where like your ally faction just over over conquers you. And I mean, I was interested in asking like sort of the game dev solutions like. If somebody else, like if another person designs a similar game, what advice would you want to give them on designing ally factions in a way where they help but don't overhelp? That that's that's a great question because I personally actually hate the situations. Like, like, like for example, in Total War franchise, because I'm a huge fan of that franchise. I've played so Me much too. every every game of that Ooh. franchise. But in some of the games, you cannot trade provinces. In some you can, in some you can't. And in some you can, but they just won't sell you even if you offer them like 50 provinces in return. And then that your ally comes in and helps you by conquering that one province that you have been aiming for for so long. And the only option is to betray them to get that back. And that's stupid. So... Agreed. We wanted to, 100%. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I hate it, hate it when it happens because okay, I'll, it's like I love this ally, but now you made a mistake. Uh, yes. So, so our solution was that they are quite willing to sell systems to the player. Okay, they, it, it's possible to exploit it a bit in the sense that the player fights less and just buys the systems the other factions have conquered. But that in, in a sense, it's just a gameplay approach. You can also like be this mercantile industrialist who doesn't fight that much, but just comes in with the money when someone else has conquered something. And that can work too. But the idea was that they, if the allies get in the way, the player can like buy them off. And the other thing is by the end of the game, the fixed allies, okay, this is kind of a bit of a spoiler, but the fixed allies basically don't exist anymore. Stuff happened to them. And in the end, and if they were in the way, you will get the chance to claim those system back, systems back even without buying them. Mm -hmm. So like the nuisance may happen, but it will be only temporary. And I guess I was also a little curious about the free-for-all. Like in that one, you have alliances. So actually, no, look, we have a couple of questions from the chat. Like, was it intended... That, you know, I had many, millions of minerals of the uh, infinite curve that swarms to destroy it all. Okay, yeah, this is one, one more balancing issue that in most of strategy games, by the end, you will have millions of whatever the currency is in the game. So in the sense, we realized, okay, that is going to happen and we really can't 
prevent it from happening, but we at least try to make the really last end game challenge when the player actually has to put up an exp another expedition and jump to another galaxy and fight there. We try to make that real hard, so that would kind of require require the player to have really strong economy and strong production, so that the covet swarm would really be infinite and not finite. <laughs> but yeah, that that that's. That's a difficult balancing issue with every game. Of course. I mean, it's not not a lot of games. Like Total War games, especially, I don't know. Uh, up until Warhammer 3, they suffered so much with late game challenge. And uh, it's uh, totally normal for your game to suffer f from something similar every now and then as well. Simply because, you know, games in your genre uh do this all the time uh, but i guess what really matters to me personally as somebody who is very passionate about game design somebody who likes forex is i'm really curious about the lessons you learned working on pegasus expedition and uh, considering that uh, some of the viewers i usually have on my channel are also game devs who want to develop games and hopefully want to develop forex games as well what advice may you, as somebody who already released the title in that genre, what advice may you give to someone who would want to follow in your step and design a game like Pegasus Expedition? Well, we we I think the development of the game took all in all like three and a half years, maybe. It, it could have been a lot less, but four years ago we were quite unexperienced, inexperienced, and also the original vision of the game was something completely different. It was supposed to be a kind of a real-time RTS kind of thing with no grand campaign at all. And then during the first half a year, we just realized that, okay, we have this kind of ideas with, that we could add into it, and those new ideas are actually much more fun than the original idea. So we like let it change a lot. But I think that was a good idea because if we had just like kept with the first thing, even though even we didn't feel like it's fun, so that that would have would not have ended well. So, well, maybe my my advice number one is that if you think something is going to take six months, it's going to take a year. And if you think something is easy, it's not. <laughs> so I, I mean, so, so the, the lesson here is that if, if I think something is going to take six months, I have to like dedicate 12 months and then be happily surprised if it took only nine months. <laughs> so that don't be too optimistic because all there, there, there will always be those like unexpected issues and unexpected problems that like take extra time and everything or or you we have like design then we actually develop it and then we realize that okay this design actually sucks we have to redo this whole thing happened more than once so and that also requires time so it would be wise and we will in the future like reserve more time for that because it's unless you are some kind of genius or really like hardened veteran who really knows what he's doing then then fine maybe you you will like hit the mark every time first try but the rest of us will need kind of some wiggling room to find the yeah right part. i mean your wiggling room took you from an rds like one of the commenters rightfully notes to a space opera game but there is certain power in wiggling room right <laughs> yeah yeah no, no, i i think that it was the right path though um one thing that was maybe the most painful for us was the combat in the pegasus expedition though in the end it's not the like the main part it's still like the, the main thing is the grand strategy and the forex there and then the combats are some kind of they try to strike a balance between a real rts and then like the paradox style where you have absolutely no control over the combat so we wanted to be somewhere there between that the player so the player has some agency but we don't need to dedicate our resources to actually develop a full-fledged RTS combat Total War style because that would have been away from everything else in the game. Although that would be so cool to have something oh. like that. Oh, but... too bad. Like, uh, I, w when I was younger, like one of the things I didn't understand was like, why is there no game after Star Wars Empire at War where it's both space battles and land battles and land battles are cool uh and both systems are fully integrated and only now i'm starting to realize how rare it is to actually 
have a team that is willing to crunch for something as deep as that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's always cool when game ha games have something like that, but it, it is basically two games inside one. I mean, yeah. you develop the RTS and then you develop the actual grand strategy game and then you just put those two, two together, but the amount of time, resources, people it takes is like, well, a lot. <laughs> Would you at any point, like at any point uh, during Kala Gameworks' existence or any point in your future game developer career, be interested into creating an experience similar to Empire at War? Or do you think it's suicide? I mean, I haven't played Empire at War, but is it like it, it's a crown strategy game, but then you have battles and you said that it has... Like, Basically, like, I don't want this to be a promotion for someone else's game. After all, we're talking <laughs> about yours. Uh, but the basic premise, space battles plus land battles and grand strategy map. Okay, yeah, got it, got it. Well, personally, I, well, for that kind of game to be fun for me, the, the priority list is like first grand strategy, strategy, then the fleet battles. Because if you like imagine what warfare would be like in space, like that those fleet battles will be everything they will decide who conquers what and then the land battles are the least important in the sense that whoever has the fleet around the planet and controls the space around the planet is probably going to win it's a kind of same like a situation that during the napoleonic era whoever has the fleet around the island is going to conquer the island eventually so that that that's cool too but i mean i would probably be happy with just the grand strategy and the fleet battles if the fleet battles are like cool and epic oh 100 percent and uh, that's one of the things i think pegasus expedition sort of succeeded at you know like there's this one screenshot of like all these flares flying around and each flare is like a laser from a ship and it's blue flares and yellow flares and they fly all over and it's like wow this is like this is a battle that will decide everything and it's just a battle over one planet yeah in that sense like how how do you even like manage the different scales of this game you know because uh, even with like one planet you can have hundreds of different ships big ships small ships how do you not go insane managing that scale oh uh, well with this game, we kind of wanted to still take one step back from full RTS because if it was full RTS, then the player would really have to manage everything by themselves. And we felt like that would take like take up too much of, of the game. So with with the uh, combat in the Pegasus expedition, you like you set the approach routes for the fleets, but then when the combat starts, they kind of they follow the orders you gave beforehand. And at that point, you, you don't like, you can't give them more direct movement orders, but you more like just see how your battle plan worked out. So kind of to both have the epic feeling and the scale, but at the same time to make it a bit more relaxing at yeah. that point. We are, we have been do, we've been talking for a while now, and I would like to ask one last question. It would actually okay. be a question from the comment. Okay. Uh, and I think it's an amazing question to wrap it at like a perfect note with a bit of a cliffhanger. If there was a Pegasus expedition to, if there was, if yep. nobody's assuming anything, you don't have to tell us of any of your plans. What would you wish the space battles were like to play? Okay. If I were to create Pegasus expedition two or basically any other sci-fi game, like similar grand strategy game, I would really enjoy full RTS combat. Like something like with the may, maybe a bit less fleets or like units that are consist of many units, but in the sense that the player has like 20 moving parts or something, not hundreds, but like let's say 20 moving parts that they can command around and maneuver. Like, I mean, I really enjoy naval battles in Total War series and, and Battlefleet Gothic, if you know that one. Oh, so yeah, yeah, that one's something. Classic. Something something similar to those would be so awesome and so cool. So of, of course it's it's like it's resource heavy to create something like that, but it would be so cool. So if I ever get to make a decision like that, then something like that would be awesome. Uh, base building or pre-build? Base building, you ask. Base building in the sense that you know more more like Age of Empire style or more Total War style. I mean, I, I would go for 
Total War style in the sense that the player builds the infrastructure um, in the grand map, and then when the fleets fight each other, then okay, maybe you can have something like quickly de deployable stuff, but it, it will be mainly would would mainly be a fight between the two fleets that have encountered each other in the yeah, space. That makes sense. I want to shoot huge thanks to today's chat. Guys, you were legends. This was the most active chat I had on this stream in ever. Thank you so much for coming here. Uh, thank you so much, Yako. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone here. Please follow the Discord, both Moby Dictum and Pegasus Expedition. Uh, yeah. Is Pegasus Expedition on sale right now? By yeah, the way? I, if if I may, I would like to have like to say two words about that. So if someone who be watching this and uh, felt like the game is interesting, it is right now 50% off um, in Steam. So it's a great time to pick it up. And also it's nominated for this story rich experience, outstanding story rich game or something in Steam Awards. So if you felt like it was a good story rich experience, please consider giving it your vote. Just open the store page and the, you could, should be able to click it there. And also the link is in um, Pegasus Expedition Discord. And yeah. thanks, Kai. thanks guys for watching and commenting and everything. It was really cool like discussing with you as well yeah you have some loyal fans thank you so much without you this would not have been possible so like and subscribe to this channel we will have a lot of cool stuff next week we will have two game designers from old cables interactive which is a turkish tabletop supplement company that basically design additional rules for D D. And feel free to join us. Feel free to come. We'll be waiting for all of you. Thank you so much.